Yeah. I'm gonna you call it the IT meet guy. Yourself, Jessica. Where do I do meet? So are we good? Hold on, let me see if uh Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. And what we're going to talk about tonight is how PRP and stem cells can make an important connection between operative and non-operative treatment for disorders such as osteoarthritis and tendonitis problems. My name is Dr. Henry Stein, and I'm with Beacon Orthopedics here in Cincinnati. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis, what that is, it's the loss of the cartilage that's attached to the end of our bones. And osteoarthritis can be due to having a previous injury. It can be genetic, inherited. It can be a wear and tear. Or most often, it's due to a combination of all the above. Um, osteoarthritis is also due to the loss of the stasis or the normal balance of repair and breakdown inside the joint. So if we look at models of the knee here, the picture on the left, the pink. Let me find them. I'm finding them. Okay. The pink yeah. cartilage, yeah. the knee all the way on the left, that is a normal knee. That cartilage that you yeah. see there is the, the cartilage is attached to the end of the bone. And if you look at the middle picture and you look at the picture all the way on the left, you'll see where that cartilage is worn down. Most of the time what happens is that cartilage wears off the end of the bone, much like paint flaking off the ceiling. It's a gradual process. Uh, folks will get a sore, achy stiffness. And every once in a while, the osteoarthritis progresses at a more rapid rate, kind of like a chunk of plaster falling out of the ceiling. And when that leads to a definite difference in how the joint feels, um, that can happen spontaneously. Um, you can step the wrong place at the wrong time, you can fall on it, you can twist it, and it kind of stirs things up. And this is just another picture here uh, showing how arthritis progresses over a number of years from an early stage where occasionally you get a little achy soreness when you overdo it to the point where less activity makes you achy, sore, maybe you feel it the next morning to the point where you have late-stage osteoarthritis where you know it's there pretty much all the time when you're awake. And oftentimes, it'll wake up people at night as well. So why does osteoarthritis progress? And there's a lot of factors, but one of the concepts to understand, hold on for one second. Oh, I think we got some technical problems here. Uh, how do we sign on? Let's see here. See, there's other people in there. You have to go up to. Why? Why can't we? Can you guys see that now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I didn't realize that we weren't projecting there. So have you guys been hearing me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and back a, a couple slides because I know they weren't there. And we're going to just talk yeah. a little bit about it. And I mentioned here the, the progress of osteoarthritis over a period of time. Can you guys see that okay? <laughs> so the slide on the left is a normal knee. That pink material is the cartilage attached to the end of the bone. And when you look at the picture in the middle, and you look at the picture over on the right, that's the progression of osteoarthritis over a period of time. And this is just another slide illustrating this, where the knee on the left has very early changes, just one area of the knee. And as the osteoarthritis uh, progresses, you can see its involvement in the middle of the thigh bone, and eventually all three uh, parts of the uh, knee are involved. So homeostasis is the balance where the body is always repairing, recycling, remodeling itself. And it does that with normal wear and tear. Our skin will turn itself over in about a week. Every blood cell we have in our body brand new in about three weeks. And our joints repair the normal wear and tear just from being on it, walking, running, jumping, uh, just living life. And homeostasis, what that is, it's maintaining the normal balance and the chemical composition of body fluids. 
it's much like an ecosystem that has soil, plant, water, sun, and wind involved, and you have to have the right balance in order for things to grow. So if you look at this flower bed here, uh, these impatiens here are all in the same bed, same soil condition, same, same amount of wind, same amount of water, but for some reason there, the plants over on the right aren't doing too well. And the reason for that is there's an imbalance there because you see that big hole in the sky where for a few hours every day there's too much sunlight and it throws things off. So that is kind of what happens inside our knee. This is a picture of the knee here. The knee is housed in fluid. It has a membrane that wraps it around it kind of like a water balloon. And inside, uh, it's very uh, biochemically active. And what happens when osteoarthritis progresses, the joint stops producing the protein, enzymes, and molecules that repair, recycle, and remodel, and they're mainly making protein, enzymes, and molecules that break tissue down, cause pain, cause inflammation. And that's when we get symptoms. And what the biologic treatments do is they, they stop the production of the harmful substances and get the joint back in the repair, recycle, remodel mode, and gets it back in, in, in the condition of homeostasis. So if we look at knee osteoarthritis, the slide over here that you see on the left, that is a normal knee. You'll see there's quite a bit of space between the, the, the bone, the, the thigh bone and the shin bone, both on the outside of the knee and the inside of the knee. And if you look over here at the slide on the right, you'll see that over here, it appears that the bone is actually sitting on the bone. And the reason that happens is the cartilage has worn off the end of the bone the cushion or the meniscus that sits between the bone wears down along with that. And when you take an x-ray, because the x-ray beam goes through the meniscus and the cartilage, that's why you have that apparent space. But understand, this is not dry bone sitting on dry bone. We have a lubricating fluid inside our joint. So there's always a fluid interface between the two bones that um, will still provide uh, some nourishment and lubrication to the joint. So if we look at osteoarthritis of the knee, it can occur in a number of different areas. If you look here again, this is the outside of the knee, and this is the inside of the knee. The inside is called the medial compartment, and that is by far the most common type of osteoarthritis that we see. That is followed by arthritis involving the kneecap joint. This x-ray here is kind of like looking down in your knee, kind of like you're looking in a garden hose. This is the skin here. This is the thigh bone and this is the kneecap. And the kneecap normally travels in a groove here, much like a rope and a pulley. And you can see there's plenty of space between the kneecap and the thigh bone here. But here it's again, the bones appear to be uh, right against each other. And this is lateral compartment osteoarthritis. It's not involving the inside like you see here. It's involving the outside part. And lateral compartment osteoarthritis is much less forgiving because the knee is not symmetrical. The contact area between the bones is different. The meniscus has a different shape. So when osteoarthritis affects the lateral compartment, it's very difficult to treat. And this shows the same thing with hip osteoarthritis. If we look over here on the left, You'll see a normal hip, and again, this pink material uh, represents the cartilage attached to the end of the bone. This is the ball, and this is the socket. And you'll notice there's quite a difference between the knee joint and the, <coughs> excuse me, the hip joint. The knee works like a hinge. In other words, these two bones bend back and forth, and this slides uh, over the end to guide the, the tendon through the bone, where this is a ball and socket joint, and it behaves completely different in terms of its response to treatment. And, and again, this will happen in other joints. If you look here, you'll see uh, also, this is a normal hip. You see plenty of space here between the bones. This is the midline of the midline of the body, and this is the right hip over here. You can see the bone has a much whiter uh, appearance to it, and we call that sclerosis. You can see that the space between the bone has narrowed down. And you can see some bone spur mm -hmm. or osteophytes uh, have developed on the end of the bone because what happens where osteophytes and bone spurs come from is when cartilage is worn off the end of the bone, the body tries to repair it, and it puts bone wherever it wants to. So oftentimes yeah. people say, well, why can't you just go in there surgically and remove the bone spur? The reason for that, it will grow back like a weed. 
In other words, if you go and remove the bone spur, there's a new injury to the surface of the bone. The body thinks it needs to repair it and puts a new one in its place over time. This is showing the shoulder joint. Normally, it's a nice round head, ball and socket joint. You can see the space here between the two bones. And here you see again, the space is completely narrowed. You see a large osteophyte down here. And then you just see that here the bone has a nice smooth grayish context to it here. And here it kind of looks a little moth eaten. And those are subchondral cysts. And what that means is the bone is kind of worn away under the surface of the bone. And that's part of what you see on x-rays with osteoarthritis. So in addition to the cartilage wearing off on the end of the bone, the fibrocartilage in the knee is called a meniscus, in a shoulder and in a hip, it's called a labra. And that cushion wears away, the two go hand in hand. And then the ligaments that hold the bones together, a ligament is like a rope that holds two blocks of wood together. That stretches out like a rubber band. It does not go back in place. And that leads to an unstable joint where people feel like their joint is going to give out, them, out on them. And then as the osteoarthritis progresses even further, the joint eventually scars down and you lose motion in the joint. You can't straighten it all the way, all the way. It's stuck and you can't bend it all the way. So <clears throat> meniscal tears, people, there's a lot of confusion about that. The meniscus is this cushion that sits here between the bone. And the red zone is the part of the meniscus that has a blood supply to it. This white zone here does not have a blood supply. So this is analogous to your fingernail. In other words, if you tear the white part of your fingernail, it's not going to grow back. Uh, so you have to snip the little white piece off. If you, re if, you, if you injure your nail plate and the nail gets removed, the body will grow a new one because there's a blood supply there. So when you're looking at meniscal tears, there's different ways they can tear. <laughs> They can tear in this direction here, the lengthwise. You can get a little uh, tear here where you have this little, what they call a parapy. Mm -hmm. It can tear this way here. And again, what's been <clears throat> misunderstood for a number of years is when people have advanced osteoarthritis, they go to the doctor, they have knee pain, they get an MRI scan, it shows, oh, you have a meniscal tear. We're going to go ahead and take the meniscus out, but guess what? The pain doesn't go away because the pain was not caused by the tear in the meniscus. It was caused by the osteoarthritis. Now, when you have a healthy knee with no osteoarthritis and you have a meniscal tear in it, or a meniscus is flipped over on itself where the knee is stuck, that is definitely where surgery can help. If you have osteoarthritis in a knee and you get part of the meniscus removed surgically, uh, one of three things is going to happen to the knee. And this is their studies where they've looked at 12 13,000 patients over a period of years, and it breaks down into thirds. People that have moderate to advanced osteoarthritis, they start to get part of their meniscus removed. About a third are going to feel better for a few months. A third are going to feel better, not any improvement at all, and a third are going to feel worse. The other thing that's been found out over the last number of years, that if you take someone that has a moderate amount of osteoarthritis and you go in and remove part of the meniscus, you shorten the time until you need to get a knee replacement because the meniscus, even though it's injured, still has a function in providing cushion to the joint. So if you have a joint that's lost the cartilage off the end of the bone, now you're taking the cushion out, it only makes sense that the knee is going to hurt worse. Switching over to tendons, because we treat a lot of tendons as much as we treat osteoarthritis, the job of a tendon is to attach a muscle to a bone. And if you look at how a tendon is constructed here, you'll see it's made up of these individual collagen fibers that are woven together in bands. And when the process, to, uh, with a tendon injury, whether it's your rotator cuff, whether it's your Achilles tendon, whether it's the patellar tendon, whether it's the plantar fascia, the process is the same. You get these tiny little micro tears in here that heal up with scar tissue. The scar tissue doesn't have the same strength it does not have the same elasticity. So as you do the same thing over and over, you perpetuate the process where now instead of just getting individual fibers involved, you get multiple bands. The picture over here on the left shows a normal tendon. When the body tries to do it again, it does it in a haphazard way. And one reason that it's so difficult to treat tendons is because they don't have a good blood supply. That's one reason it's very difficult for them to heal on their own. It's also why Many times when you operate on a tendon, uh, there is a re-tear rate because that tissue is not very strong. 
And the way tendon injuries progress over a period of time, again, understanding the tendon attaches a muscle to a bone, this is the bone, and this is the buildup of scar tissue or tendinosis. And what will happen, because that tissue doesn't have the same elasticity nor the same strength, with normal use, it's going to start getting bigger tears where it pulls away from the bone. We call it a partial thickness tear or it pulls away completely. We call that a full thickness tear or you get tears that run the length of the tendon, kind of like getting a split in a clothesline. Um, and those become very painful and they reduce the function and the ability to use the joint in a normal fashion. So how do we treat osteoarthritis and tendinopathy without doing operation and actually getting healing to take place? And over the last 10 to 12 years, um, it's come to this country a little bit later than the rest of the world, but we're using our body's own stem cells and platelets to actually stop the progression of osteoarthritis and tendon injuries and get the joint back in a repair recycle mode. So stem cells, they are basically our body's repair cells. And the type of stem cells that we use are called mesenchymal stem cells because these stem cells will only repair recycle and rebuild muscle, bone, cartilage, tendon, connective tissue. They will not generate an eye in your knee. Uh, these tendons, uh, these cells um, have matured to the point where putting them in one's body doesn't cause tumors. You can get that with embryonic stem cells, uh, but we don't use those in orthopedics. And these stem cells, they're termed autologous, meaning that they come from the same patient. In other words, you don't risk any disease or gen genetic diseases. You don't have to worry about tissue allergy. You don't have to re worry about tissue rejection. And our stem cells, what they do is they repair all our body's tissues on a regular basis. If they didn't work, we wouldn't be alive. And where they, where they live, where do they come from? They come from another, uh, a lot of different tissues. They'll come from the bone marrow. That's where they're fairly highly concentrated. Uh, there are also tremendous amounts of uh, stem cells in our adipose or our fat tissue. Uh, there are stem cells in our muscles, and most importantly, there's uh, stem cells that are attached to blood vessels, and those are called pericytes. And when there's an injury, the growth factors from platelets stimulate the release of the stem cell where it's attached to the blood vessel, and it goes to the area of injury. So circulation is very important because that's how the growth factors get in the circulation to bring the stem cell to the site of injury. And uh, folks, there's the, the, in, in orthopedics, generally in this country, we use stem cells that are, are derived from the bone marrow. Now, stem cells that arrive from the fat are much high, more highly concentrated than those that you get from the, uh, from the bone marrow. The problem being that the stem cells from fat oftentimes are not biologically active. In other words, our fat tissue has, has a framework to it, and the stem cells are attached to that framework, much like grapes on a vine. For the stem cells to be active and work, they have to be pulled off the vine. And that's done by a chemical process called a stromovascular fraction or an SVR. The name's not that important, but the FDA says we are not allowed to do a stromal vascular fraction in this country to release stem cells from the fat cells. The rest of the world is able to do it, but the FDA has their rules and we have to abide by them, otherwise they will shut our doors. So are there any risks uh, when you use your body's own stem cells? There's been, and this is 2018, so I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna have to update to 2019, but there's a close to 15,000 studies Look at how mesenchymal stem cells work in the body. And there's been a lot of studies looking at the safety of these stem cells. And again, how we harvest the stem cells from the bone marrow is not a new procedure. Hematologists and oncologists have been doing bone marrow aspirations for as long as they've been practicing hematology um, because that is how they diagnose anemia and other type of blood disorders. So doing a bone marrow aspiration is not a new or a novel procedure. And we also use PRP with platelets and <clears throat> with the stem cells. And PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Platelets, they are the particles in your bloodstream that if you cut yourself, not only do they stop the bleeding, but they also help the tissue. Well, when we use stem cells, 
to treat osteoarthritis, mm-hmm. you always yeah, use that would be really along with it out. because mm-hmm. PRP works much like a biologic project manager. In other words, the platelets will tell the stem cells what proteins to produce. They will recruit more stem cells to the site of injury, and they will also tell the stem mm-hmm. cells to start dividing. When we treat tendon injuries, we usually use PRP by itself, and we will sometimes use PRP by itself in early osteoarthritis. So this is a microscopic picture. These little purple particles that you see here, these are the platelets in the bloodstream, and they are produced by our liver, and our body literally makes millions a day. And if we didn't have platelets, we wouldn't be able to survive because uh, they keep us from bleeding to death. If they are overactive, they lead the blood clot. So um, how they work in orthopedics is when these little purple spots here come in contact with injured tissue, they basically burst open and they release proteins in the circulation called the growth factors. And what they do is they recruit the stem cells to the area of injury. And the way they get there is via the circulation. So you have to have blood flow in order for the platelets and stem cells to come in contact with each other. In other words, the blood vessels, they are basically the roadways where they get from one construction site to another. And what PRP does, it basically kickstarts or accelerates the healing phase by releasing these growth factors. And instead of leading down the road to scar tissue, it leads down the road to healthy tissue. So again, PRP is used by itself to treat tendons. And most often we will do those uh, treatments without stem cells. Now having said that, Sometimes folks will have tendon injuries. If you recall the slide I showed you earlier where the tendon is partially pulled away from the bone, in that instance, we may use stem cells with PRP because it needs a little bit more of a kick so that torn part of the tendon can reattach itself to the bone. Now, if the tendon is completely torn off the bone or most of the tendon is uh, torn off the bone, That is something that needs to be repaired surgically because PRP is not going to put two detached ends of a tendon back together, nor will stem cells. Now, interestingly, uh, what we've also been doing surgically is when people sometimes have bad tendon ruptures, uh, the tendon is thrown back together surgically, and then PRP is injected into the two ends of the injured tendon that have been repaired surgically to help with the healing. So when we look at... Um, PRP, um, we do that with early osteoarthritis, and that's one reason that we, um, you know, unless someone has bone-on-bone osteoarthritis where you don't know how much osteoarthritis they have, um, we usually get MRI scans, and the reason for that is the MRI scan <clears throat> helps us actually see how much cartilage is left on the bone or how much is worn off. In other words, that cartilage has a thickness of a few millimeters. So if you look at the wall board in the room that you're in, if you can imagine that being the cartilage on the end of the bone and the studs behind the uh, wall board being the bone, grade one cartilage loss is a little bit in the wall board. Grade two is about a third of the way through. Grade three is two thirds of the way through. And grade four is down to the bone. Mm-hmm. Studies have shown with early osteoarthritis, such as grade one and two cartilage loss, PRP can be used by itself. When you mainly have grade four and grade three, uh, that's where the two need to be used together. And a lot of studies are ongoing right now across the world looking at how often do you do the treatment, um, how much PRP do you use, and we're still trying to find all that out because this process and this field is expanding very, very rapidly. So how do we use stem cells to treat osteoarthritis? The protocol that we use when we're treating osteoarthritis is a three-part treatment, okay? The first one is called the prolotherapy treatment. And what that involves is we take a concentrated dextrose solution. Dextrose is a naturally occurring carbohydrate that's produced and utilized by our body for energy. Its concentration inside a joint is less than 1%. We take a 25% solution, inject it into the joint, and a 25% solution is a 2,500-fold increase in the concentration inside the joint. And what that does 
It's kind of a wake-up call that a joint that needs to go back to work. You can envision this pushing a primer on your lawnmower before you pull the cord. It kind of primes the joint for the stem cells and platelets that are coming within the next couple of days. So the stem cells, we obtain those from the bone marrow, and the bone that we use is called the iliac crest. That's located um, along your waistline uh, right above the butt cheek. Uh, that bone takes about 10 to 15 minutes to numb up, and the needle is not placed in the bone until we're told that you're not feeling any sharp or you're feeling any discomfort. And then it takes about 15, 20 minutes. To, it takes about 15, 20 minutes to do the bone marrow aspiration, and then from the bone marrow we obtain the stem cells as well as the PRP, and that gets injected back into the knee, and then we do a th or the hip or the shoulder or the ankle or the elbow. Uh, whatever joint that we're treating. And then within seven days, the final treatment is another PRP treatment. In that treatment, the blood is drawn from the vein, just like when you go to the lab to get your blood drawn for blood tests. We concentrate the platelets for osteoarthritis about 20 times normal with no white cells or red cells. That gets injected back into the joint. And what that does, it works as a booster to keep the process going that was started a few days before. Uh, with with the stem cell treatment, it's kind of like putting fertilizer down on a newly seeded lawn. So from the time folks get stem cells and PRP injected in the joint, be it a shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, it usually takes about six to eight weeks before you notice a difference in how your joint feels. Six to eight weeks out, your joint's still going to be hurt. You may be able to do more activity before it starts to bother you. You may be able to do some things then that don't bother you now. Or if you do something to flare it up, instead of taking a couple of weeks to cool down, it may cool down a day or two. But typically, it takes about 12 to 16 weeks, three to four months, to know a, a significant improvement in how the joint feels. Now, we used to tell folks about six months to a year to get as good as you're going to get. But one thing that we do with this protocol is we track our outcomes. Every patient that gets this protocol uh, becomes part of a patient registry. And what that involves is about a 10-minute questionnaire prior to treatment, asking you questions about how your joint functions. Then after treatment, you get a survey monkey once a month for the first year, asking you the same questions in a condensed form. And that data is collected over a number of years. And what that tells us is how joints are responding to treatment. Some respond better than others. Um, why did it result one person, not another person? Um, and the only way that you know that it works is by tracking your outcomes. And some people will say this is the best thing since sliced bread. Other people will say you're selling snake oil. Well, we're still learning because we have to collect the data to understand what's working. Mm -hmm. And the other important reason to collect the data is when people ask about these treatments, they want to know, are they a good candidate? Is this something I need? And uh, is this something I need a, a joint replacement for? Um, or is this something to buy on its own? So once the treatment is given, physical therapy is very important for getting range of motion back, as well as getting muscle strength, and well, as well as getting balance strength. And there's a list of medications that can adversely affect the outcome. Non-steroidals need to be stopped. Corticosteroids will definitely keep this treatment from working. Uh, there's certain types of cholesterol medicines, certain type of blood pressure medicines that also have been shown to keep stem cells divided. So how is PRP used? If you're using PRP to treat a tumor, uh, generally what is done is we need to use part, and then the patient comes back about six to eight weeks later and we see how to do it. If the patient is doing quite a bit better, we don't do a treatment. If we do two treatments and people come back in six weeks and they've not yet made a lot of progress, then we would probably go ahead and do a third treatment. Uh, physical therapy is a big part of the overall outcome and success rate because these structures are injured. They haven't been used in a normal fashion for a period of time and they have to learn how to function in a normal way again. So one of the big questions is, do stem cells regenerate cartilage? So if you look on the internet, you're going to see these, you're going to see these 
Uh, before and after pictures. If you look over here, you see this picture of horrible osteoarthritis on the right knee, on the right hip. And this picture okay. says, boy, after this treatment, the hip looks normal. Same way when you look over here at the knee. Very, very narrow space between both sides of the joint. And over here, the knee looks normal. Again, looking down here, there's a picture. And again, this person did a treatment we can't do, stromal vascular fraction. You see bone on bone osteoarthritis here, and you see the joint space has come back. I've been practicing medicine for 30 years. I have never seen this in a patient, okay? There's a lot of different ways. You can simply change the angle of the x-ray beam for 20 by 20 degrees and make this yes. knee here look like that knee there. What these treatments do in most patients that have osteoarthritis like this or osteoarthritis like this, or osteoarthritis like this, is they stop or they arrest the osteoarthritic process. They keep it from going any further. It stops the pain and it stops the inflammation and it allows the joint to perform in a normal fashion. So if you look at, if you take the age group of people that are 55 and over that have gotten these treatments, and let's say you have 100 patients that have gotten a positive response. A positive response is defined as a decrease in pain, an increase in function, and not needing to get a joint replacement. Studies have followed these people out with MRIs two years out, three years out, four years out. And about 20% of the patients that have a positive response will show regeneration of new cartilage. The other 80% show no progression of the osteoarthritis. And guess what? All 100 patients feel the same. Now, if you take folks that are in their late teens or early 20s and knock a piece of cartilage off the end of the bone, play a basketball, football, wrestling, what have you, and you use this treatment to repair the cartilage in somebody that's very young, you get an MRI scan about two years later, almost in all these young people, the MRI scan looks completely normal. When you look at people in their 30s and 40s, that's kind of a mixed bag. They don't have the dramatic response that young people do but they also, on MRI scan, will show more cartilage than someone that has very advanced osteoarthritis at a later age. So that's important to understand. So if you're looking at a center where they're touting these x-rays here, I'd beware because this is generally something that you don't see, or at least we haven't seen yet. Now, with the treatments that we have now, and we get x-rays five, ten years ago from, from now, um, you may see that that happens, but right now, uh, most of us haven't seen this. So again, um, when I talk about what the treatment does, it stops production of all these harmful substances. Another way to look at it, I grew up on Lake Erie, and most of the cars when I had, or a kid had rust holes in it. So let's say you get a new car, it gets a little dent, and you get a little bit of rust on it. And it goes through a winter up north where it's getting salt thrown on it winter after winter after winter. Pretty soon that little rust spot becomes a big rust hole. But let's say that car has a rust spot on it. It's one year old. And that car moves down to Arizona, never sees the smoke again. The chance of that rust spot becoming bigger and becoming a rust hole are, are pretty much uh, uh, unlikely and unheard of. So the protocol that we use is the Regenix protocol. And what that is, is, is that a, it, it's a process that we use that uh, when we make the PRP, we don't use a commercial kit from a drug company where every PRP is made the same. In other words, what's been shown, especially over the last five years, is you use a much higher concentration of PRP for osteoarthritis than you do for a tendon because you won't get the results that you want. The way we get the cells from the bone marrow and the lab methods that we use produce much higher yield of stem cells and other methods. And every patient that gets the treatment, we count the amount of stem cells that we harvest, and it gets recorded in the patient registry. Um, Regenix has full-time biologists and biochemists that work in state-of-the-art labs to give us new information as soon as it's av available to us to help out with our patients. Um, and again, we talked about this patient registry. Um, and when people come in and they talk about their symptoms, I can walk a mile and a half, I can walk two blocks, their knee or their hip doesn't straighten out, they're taking, you know, 
narcotic pain medicines every day, they're cigarette smokers, they're probably not going to do very well. Uh, people that are motivated, that get better, that have good range of motion in their joint, that are close to ideal body weight, that aren't cigarette smokers, they don't have diabetes, um, all those things are considered. Uh, for instance, if someone has bad arthritis in, let's say, their right hip because they fell off a horse when they were 20, and now they're 50 and they have bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis, but they have absolutely no osteoarthritis in any other joint, they're going to be a good candidate. So let's say someone comes in that wants to get their shoulder treated, but they've had knee replacements in both knees, hip replacements in both knees. That is more of a genetic disease, so the outcome is not going to be as well. So that's what we gather, and that's the information that we need to know to see if we can truly help somebody with these treatments because it's not for everybody. In fact, most people that seek these treatments, um, when we look at scans or their medical history or their operative report, oftentimes um, what will happen is they may be better candidates for a joint replacement than they are for a, a biologic. So another bit of confusion out there is when you look at websites, especially those run by chiropractors, they are touting um, amniotic and umbilical cord stem cells. Okay, in the last few months, especially since this past summer, the FDA has shut down more and more of these clinics across the country for misrepresenting and misbranding what they're giving their patients. Okay, these, the only approved use in this country for cord blood stem cells are for hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplantation. Those are for procedures where people have leukemia, lymphoma, and other blood disorders. We have no, we have no, the FDA has not given us any allowance other than in research setting to use umbilical cord stem cells for orthopedic implantation. We can use stem cells in fat, but they don't work as well unless you do something like a stromovascular fraction, which can be done in the rest of the world, and we use them from bone marrow. Now, what these products do have in them is they have a lot of growth factors and proteins that you find in PRP. They also have hyaluronic acid in it, which you'll find in things like synvisc and orthovisc. Um, and they do have a role because um, they will recruit stem cells to the site of injury, but they themselves do not contain stem cells. PRP does the same thing. So oftentimes, um, you can look at an amniotic or a cord injection as an expensive PRP injection. Now, we have some data that in certain instances, um, when we use these amniotic uh, products for tendon problems or osteoarthritic problems, or we use them together with stem cells, they will sometimes lead to a positive outcome. But what happens is that, um, you know, chiropractors who in the state of Ohio and Kentucky aren't even allowed to give a patient injection have to hire someone to give you the injection. So you're not getting treated by a physician. Um, you're oftentimes not getting an MRI scan. And patients have also often told us they're not even getting a physical exam. We had one gal ask us, she wanted to ask them what were they getting. And they said, we're not telling you until you, you sign the consent form and, and write a check for us. So, um, and again, when you don't have a patient registry and people are doing this, this is where this treatment can get a bad name. Um, and there's, uh, this is, these are just some of the products that are out there on the market, the amniotic products, Amniofix, BioRestore, Flowgraft, Ovation. And what you see here on these plots on the middle where it says B, those are what are called scatter plots. And the gray that you see in here in the red, okay, those are where the stem cells are migrating across the gray. And you will see here, you don't see any of those in those products at all. And this has been proven. This was done at Colorado State. It's been reproduced at Stanford University. It's been reproduced at the University of Pittsburgh, which is probably the largest regenerative university in the country. So, and again, people are looking at ways to get around this. So, Renew Stem is a company here. Um, what they did when the FDA got on, they took out the word stem cell. Okay, so now you don't know what you're getting. Okay, but they're not giving people stem cells, so we don't know what you're getting. You don't know what kind of cell it is. And, and again, no data, no outcomes. Um, if you look over here, um, in here, when you look at these check marks here, for some reason, they made a comment that there's no dead babies involved in this tissue. I don't know what they're talking about when they do that. 
stem cells heal so many things. And of course, that's what stem cells do. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't be alive. And what you really have to look out for is when you see a clinic that does this right here. They are doing anti-aging, they're treating stroke, they're treating ALS, they're treating spinal cord injuries, they're treating autism, they're treating diabetes. These people have to be tremendously, tremendously intelligent. The reason I say that is I've been practicing orthopedics for 30 years, and I try as best as I can to keep up every day in my own field, and every day I'm learning new things. How a patient come into a clinic and see a specialist that's an expert in all these different fields, that is a red flag. And you see these sort of clinics here, um, sounds too good to be true. And as far as I know, there is no medical specialist that is this wise to be specialized in this many areas. And if you ask these persons, are you board certified in endocrinology? That's what diabetic doctors do. Are you a board certified dermatologist? Are you a board certified neurologist? Are you a board certified rheumatologist? So if you're treating all these things, you have to be bored in quite a few specialties. And like I say, these people got to be brilliant, but you know, watch out because it's, uh, it's definitely a red flag. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to minimize this here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute um, and I'm going to open this up for questions here if I can manage to do this right here. Bear with me one second here. Can you guys hear me okay? Are there any questions at all? There's some over here. Can you guys hear me okay? Are you are you respond to them? Yes. Okay. Well they're not showing up here on mine. Okay. Here we go. I see there's a question here. What type of PRP do you use for osteoarthritis? Okay. Um, and like I said, the PRP that we use for osteoarthritis, um, we use a concentration about 20 times above baseline. And what I mean by that is that um, we, take, we take the platelets from the circulation, we get rid of the red cells, and we get rid of the white cells, and we concentrate the platelets to about 20 times normal. Now, if you did PRP that was 20 times normal, and put it in a, in a tendon to try to get the tendon cells to grow, that concentration is way too high. And what it, would, what it would do, it would not work. By the same token, if you use a low concentration of 8 to 10 times normal, which you use for a tendon and put it in a joint, it's not going to work very well either because these, uh, the different concentrations allow the PRP to do different things. For instance, the lower concentrations will usually help generate uh, blood vessels in a tendon tissue. Well, you don't want to generate blood vessels in the soft tissue around the joint because that's going to give you an inflamed, irritated joint. Okay. Are there any other questions at all? Okay, well, thank you for participating, and I, ho I hope it was informative, and uh, you got something out of the hour that you spent with us. Thank you very much, and have a good night. It's 747. When we ask any them, could they hear us too then? I hope not. I asked her if she could help us hook it up. She says, um, not without being there either. You'd have to access the web browser on the TV. Oh, help we'll cut up. Or you open the webinar on your phone and project the screen onto your TV like a wireless monitor. Oh, that sounds too complicated, Renee. Really. I was wondering if we could put that on the big one in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 